Thank you, is it? Thank you, Michael. Um, as brevity is the soul of wit, I will be brief. Um, here's the issue. Um, for a long time, we've had this um, idea or a construct or a fantasy called human nature. In fact, we've had this idea or fantasy or a construct called nature. Now, the Be Baconian anthem is um, conquer nature and improve mankind's estate. Um, and there's an, obvious, um, there's an obvious conflict implicitly, potentially, which is that when you start to fiddle futz, to use the technical term, with human nature, um, how far can you go and still have such a thing as nature? Um, we have to consider whether the concept of human nature um, remains a valid, um, a valid concept, if indeed it was to begin with. And that's all I want to say. I'm going to uh, turn it over now to uh, Vic, Vicki Prince, um, who is the Dean of Students of Biological Sciences here at the University of Chicago, as well as a professor in the Department of Organismal um, Biology and Anatomy. I'm very pleased that she will serve at the, as the moderator for the first, uh, for the first set of talks. Vicki. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. So I'm going to jump straight in by introducing our first speaker, who is the remote speaker. So I, I hope all the electronic piece of this is going to work beautifully. Uh, so Gaiman Bennett is Associate Professor of Religion, Science and Technology at Arizona State University. He holds a PhD in Anthropology from Berkeley and a PhD in Philosophical Theology from the Graduate Theological Union at Berkeley. Uh, his interests lie broadly in the cultural anthropology of science. He works on the problem of modernity in contemporary religion and biotechnology, its shifting moral economies, contested power relations, and uncertain modes of subjectivity. I'm just gonna mention one of his uh, published works, which is his book, Technicians of Human Dignity, uh, published in 2016 which examines the figure of human dignity in 20th century international and religious policies and its current biopolitical reconfigurations. Uh, so it's my great pleasure to welcome Professor Bennett. There's thousands of people here, Gaiman, ready to... Uh... Uh, I'm picturing a thousand people in the audience and they're all very excited that I get to be here with you. Um, if you want to just, from time to time, if somebody sort of cough or laugh or shout amen, I could appreciate that because then I'll know you're actually still in the room. If you all sneak out quietly, I'll have no way of knowing. <laughs> um, I just start with a few words of introduction and then I'm going to jump right into it. Um, I'm going to, despite the fact that I get to be with you via technology, I am going to play a little bit of the role of the Luddite. Um, but my latitude will be more about the way in which these technologies are being organized and imagined than they are about the technologies themselves. I'll leave it to others maybe to talk a bit more about the technologies themselves. And I, always, I want to say something about the social life of the institutions um, that they're a part of. And I'm going to take something of a grand tour um, through my comments. And so there's a lot going on. And I'm going to make lots of distinctions, which over Skype maybe is not the best possible way to proceed. But I hope that it sets the stage a bit um, for some of the more um, detailed and nuanced conversation to come as part of this um, workshop today. So let me just start with kind of the two big points. And then I'll jump into some of the details. The main point I want to make that I hope doesn't get lost in some of the other details as we go along. The main point I want to make is that Biotechnology today is just a species of technology from the point of view of the communities and the economies that it's part of. So there's lots of great biotechnology that's going on in scientific labs all over the country, all over the world, that are raising very interesting questions about the limits of biotechnical, or the, the limits of biological plasticity and the kinds of things we can do with things like cells as tech, understood as technologies. But as a kind of 
organizational species that lives in places like the Bay Area and Boston, biotech has become part of tech. And tech is a big business and has a major impact on our lives. And so I want to propose that one of the most important things to think about today with regard to biotechnology is how it lives in a tech landscape more broadly and the way in which that tech landscape can teach us a lot about what biotechnology might become and how it might live in the world. So that's the first big point. The second one, which I'll get to uh, in more detail in just a minute, is that science is often understood within our cultural mythology as both a product of and a driver of secularization. And secularization is thought of as fundamentally disenchanted. That is to say that a secular age has taken our sense of magic out of the world. I'll say a bit more about what I mean by that. But um, I say that as a kind of setup for suggesting a second main point to this talk, which is that I think biotechnology today has become re-enchanted. And it's become re-enchanted in a way that I don't think we particularly want, or at least as a representative of the pseudo-Luddites, um, it's not something that I want in particular. Um, so those are the two big points that I want to make. Um, uh, just a point about modality. I'm going to give this talk in four movements. The first talks a little bit about the question of secularization and how it relates to science and disenchantment. Um, the second is a bit of a sidebar, but it's important conceptually, which is I want to talk about how we think about the nature of power and how power operates in the world. And by power here, I mean the ways in which we steer our lives individually and collectively. And I want to talk about power in order to then point to an important set of features in biotechnology today. That's the third movement. And then that will then be the setup for just saying a couple of words about big tech and the logic of big tech um, in order to kind of stitch together some connections between and the way power operates in biotechnology and then in big tech more broadly. I'm going to tell this um, set of things in the mode of kind of deconstructed cuisine and just kind of go from one to the next with a little bit of juxtaposition and a little bit of storytelling in between. Um, but I hope that in the motion through all of these details, this arc of the relationship between big tech and biotech and it's this question of re-enchantment um, remains uh, present throughout each of these juxtapositions. All right, slide number one. Um, I like to throw in a little hand-drawn art from time to time to remind us that we are not just our devices. And so uh, here's a first chart to lead us into the first section of my talk. I want to say a few words about... Oh, go ahead. Gaiman, I don't but, think your yeah. slide has made it through yet, so... Oh, well, I've changed the slide. Are you, am I not, um, are you not seeing my PowerPoint up on the screen? I see your PowerPoint, but not, uh, it seems to, it appears to be stuck on the first uh, image there. Okay, well, let's see, I'll, I'll sort of reboot. I think m maybe Skype is sharing a different screen. Let's just see real quick. Technology is the best. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thinks it's uh, looking at the right thing. Let's just see what happens when we re-engage it. Okay. Is this? Is it up on the screen? Uh, it still it, appears. Your title, slide is. your title slide is, but not the uh, additional. So it's still on the title slide. Yeah. All right, we're going to give this one more try here. Great. OK, is that working now? That is working great. Hey, there is an audience there. Fantastic. All we needed was a little bit of technological hiccup to get a response. That's fantastic. All right, am I free to jump back in? Why don't you just slide forward one slide just to make sure it works? Okay, great. All right. Okay, so here's my little hand-drawn uh, chart. Uh, for each of my four sections, I'll have one of these. Uh, so this gives us just a little bit of overview. And what I intend to imply with this um, little diagram is a kind of motion between variables that turns on a circle in a certain sense, at least in the way in which I'm going to tell this story. But the first 
step on our way to the relationship between biotech and big tech is to think just a little bit about um, the story of secularization and how, um, as it were, secular moderns um, have come to think about what it means to be secular. And then in particular, the question of science and technology as both ex seemingly exemplars of and drivers of processes of secularization. And this is a kind of setup on my way to thinking about how biotechnology has become re-enchanted. Um, a last sort of general point just on this slide here is um, the questions of secularization, um, I think, are questions of power relationship, uh, not just in the kind of head-to-head -head combat sense of religious folks and secular folks fighting it out over who gets to be in control of our social lives, um, uh, but m more subtly, the way in which we conduct ourselves in the world and the way in which processes of secularization have established a set of norms for how we conduct ourselves and what those norms imply. And so the relationship between science, technology, and the kind of norms by way of which we conduct ourselves in the world is really the point of this um, first set of distinctions. I'm going to move through uh, a little bit around this idea called subtraction story, then disenchantment, and then a little bit about a concept of disembeddedness. OK, subtraction story. So the mythos of the secular from the point of view of the modern world has often been thought of as a kind of subtraction story. There's an image here um, by the artist Odd Nerdrum called Second Earth that I think um, has some resonances with this older idea of the secular as a subtraction story. Some of you may be familiar with this idea. This is the idea that the world became secular when we began to strip away a set of religious or spiritual um, mystifications about how the world works. It's a story of the idea that underneath it all there is a human nature, as Stephen mentioned, but it's a human nature that's fundamentally defined by its rationality and its need for rationality to be free from the constraints of certain kinds of superstitions. And so secularization from a certain modern perspective has been told as the subtracting away of a certain set of superstitions and the emergence of a kind of rational way of being in the world. This story has fallen on hard times. We can see the way it's fallen on hard times in the kind of culture wars about the nature of science, in a longer history of a, a, a sort of romanticism about what was lost with the rise of modernity. And I think we can also see its um, limitations, the limitations of a subtraction story. When we begin to ask the question, how did we actually get here? What kind of cultural work had to be done in order to produce a kind of secular world? So I've got two distinctions on here. The first is the secularization hypothesis. And the secularization hypothesis was basically the kind of tacit operative assumption that the more modern the world got, the more secular it would become. And it would become more secular because people would begin to rely more on science and technology and less on religion. And eventually, you would either see the marginalization of religion, spirituality, magic, this cluster of things, into the private sphere, or it would disappear altogether. That's just sociologically proven not to be true. Um, religion and um, the other uh, the other others of secularization are still around. A second point here, though, the thing about the subtraction story was really a colonial proposition, and this is a key point here. Um, this idea that to be modern is to be free from an older mystified past was part of the story Europe was telling about itself as it began to expand around the world and became a crucial part of modernity's self-understanding that somehow the non-modern was backward and you wanted to be modern. And so the story of secularization was always also a story of a kind of civilizational progress. It was the native abroad needed to be more like the civilized European and within Europe, the religious working classes needed to become more rational. And so the subtraction story was always a kind of myth that did a certain kind of political work. Um, from the great Max Weber forward, there's been a more complicated story about disenchantment. Um, Weber's story has sort of stood as the main um, account of where secularization comes from. And it comes from 
in his account, the loss of a kind of enchanted sense of the world. And in Weber's story, it's not science and technology that drive secularization, but rather a kind of disenchanting of our life worlds um, that allow for science and technology to begin to appear. Um, many of you may know Weber's story is a theological story. It's a story about the Protestant Reformation and its aftermath. Weber talks about the appearance in the world of a form of what he calls terrible loneliness. And terrible loneliness is the idea that each of us are alone in our story of salvation and that our connections to the world around us, our connections to the church, and our connection to the being of God in the world has been lost. And instead, we stand in judgment before a God that's no longer part of the world itself. In Weber's story, this is about a bigger theological debate about the intimate connections between the being of God in the world and the being of God outside of creation. As some of you will know, this is the story of the so-called nominalists. But at the heart of this is this idea that once you begin to imagine the divine as somehow outside of the created order, um, that the magic of everyday life begins to go away, leaving us standing before God's judgment in this terrible loneliness in which our connection to the things in the world and our ability to work on the things in the world um, go away. Weber's story turns out to not be the whole story. Weber's story is basically the idea that once you get God out of the being of the world, the cosmos as a kind of space of, of interconnection and enchantment begins to fall away. Um, it's more complicated than that because there are lots of stories about things like medieval alchemy, which keep on going in the world even after this threshold of the Protestant Reformation. And the reason that matters here is because for Weber, the story of disenchantment is the story of the loss of a cosmos, an idea that life fits together somehow, and that we're just left in an unfinished universe. But for lots of people in the 17th and 18th century, there was still a kind of unfinished cosmos, not just universe, cosmos in the sense of a kind of completed order of creation. And to pick one example, the story of the Calvinist alchemists, yes, there was such a thing. For the Calvinist alchemists, they had a god that was outside of the world, but they still saw material life as having a kind of enchanted nature that could be worked and needed to be worked in order to bring about its completion. The point here is that secularization, the story of secularization, gets li linked to disenchantment. Um, but disenchantment is more about just a theological problem, and thus my last slide in this section here. But disenchantment is also a long history of the way in which, through our disciplining of our everyday lives, we became disembedded from our place in the cosmos. So this is a term from the philosopher Charles Taylor, who tells a story uh, about a kind of long history of the ways in which we used to have a feel for our deep interconnectedness with the rest of the world, and now we find ourselves, as it were, individualized in the world. And this is a story of a, a, a longer political history for Charles Taylor, and the way in which we disciplined our lives in lots of everyday ways that began to dis discipline us from our sense of connection. I'll just give a few quick examples of the story that Taylor tells because it matters for the way in which biotechnology is imagined as working on discrete materials in the world that are separated. So Charles Taylor reminds us of a time in medieval Christianity when stuff could be considered holy, a kind of sacramental view of the world. And he reminds us of some of these very amusing but very profound uh, accounts of people stealing things like a blessed wafer um, and planting it in their garden in the hopes that they get better crops. Um, for Taylor, this reminds us that there was a kind of world in which everything felt interconnected. And for Taylor's story from the Lateran Council forward, we begin to see a set of religious and then secular practices where we begin to discipline ourselves individually. Things like we put pews in churches so that we could discipline the body and listen to the sermon. We put rows of seats. Um, in schools so that individuals could be separated from one another and their test scores analyzed. Um, we began to have a changing sense of hygiene where we washed our bodies differently because 
we didn't want to be reminded of our bodily interconnections. It's a long history. The point here is there's a kind of long history of the disciplining of everyday life that begins to disembed us from the world. I have a third point here, but I want to move on just in view of time. Okay, so now just a little sidebar on the way in which I think about power in order to then go into the story of biotechnology, which is the heart of what I want to talk about today. Okay, so there's been lots of work on the history of power and this question of secularization and modernity. Much of it has thought about what I'm calling here the strategies and tactics of power. Some of it has thought about this thing called social imaginaries, which I'll mention just a bit. Um, less work has been done on what I want to call the machineries of power. Some work has. Um, but I think the machineries of power are the important point with regard to thinking about the relationship between biotechnology and big tech. OK, first, um, scholars of the history of the relationships of power in the modern world, how they're connected to things like secularization and disembeddedness, have tended to think primarily about strategies and tactics of power. That is to say, how is it that powerful institutions take form in the world, and how do they operate? I have a colleague here at Arizona State who works on this in important ways, and is Ben Hurlbut. And Ben Hurlbut thinks about the fate of religion in public conversations around biotechnology, um, particularly with regard to bioethics, but not only with regard to bioethics. And when Ben does his work, some of the key distinctions that he thinks about are, what are the modes of reasoning that get to count in public discourses about the implications of biotechnology? whose voice gets to count and why relative to the kind of reasoning that they're using. Ben pays attention to regimes of government. How do things like um, bioethics commissions get set up? How is religion imagined as something that can participate or not participate in those regimes? And then all of that has implications for what uh, in the jargon is called the norms and forms of subjectivity, the forms of life that one is allowed to live in these spaces of governance that are shaped by these particular modes of reasoning. So this first slide in this section here is just to say that in thinking about power, lots of people think about these um, strategies and tactics. These strategies and tactics are often thought of as being connected to particular social imaginaries. Social imaginary is a term, again, coined by this philosopher Charles Taylor to think about all of the stuff that we all seem to take for granted that enables us to live in the world a way that we live in the world together without thinking about it very much. And there are moments in which the social imaginary begins to break down, and so we have to examine our presumptions about how we're living life together. Um, but for the most part, we can navigate life pretty easily. We can show up at a top. We can sit down in a seat. We can use technology in a particular kind of way because we have so much we take for granted about how our common lives are lived. Among people who study science and technology, there's been a lot of work on so-called socio-technical imaginaries. What are the things we assume about the nature of science and technology that govern how we live our daily lives together? That work is particularly important around these questions of biotechnology, but its limitation has been that in a, in Thinking about all of the shared assumptions about what science and technology are doing, there's been a tendency to overlook some of the most important little particulars that escape the bigger narratives. And those little particulars prove to be quite consequential. And I want to point to a couple of those um, with regard to biotechnology. So then a last point about um, the nature of power and thinking about power. Um, there are also what one could think of as the machineries of power. A machinery of power might be something like a legal system. And the point of using the term machinery here is that a set of relationships get interconnected and they begin to operate in the world in a particular way that has the effect of reproducing a certain way of existing in the world. But the machinery of power can also be the machines that we have in our lives, like this computer that I'm using or these little leashes that we keep in our pockets these days. And these little machines also operate in a certain kind of way to shape 
how we live our lives. These machines are characterized by what I'd like to call the metaphysics of practice. I get this from um, the history of science. And the metaphysics of practice is a particular kind of term here. The metaphysics of practice talks about the way in which our interactions with these machines not only imply a certain kind of metaphysical understanding of the world, but they produce a particular kind of metaphysics as we begin to use them. That is to say, certain things about the nature of our lives get shaped by these machines at the most fundamental level. And we can think about the metaphysics of practice, and I'm going to say something about this with regard to biotech, with regard to two variables. First, what gets called lock-in effects. Each one of these technologies, like this phone here, is built with assumptions about how the world should work and how the designers of these technologies want it to work. So those technologists' assumptions about the world get built into these technologies, and then when I use these technologies, they shape my life in relationship to those locking steps. But also, and at the same time, each one of these technologies excludes a whole set of experiences. And often, the exclusions are actually more important. So when I'm addicted to this little cell phone, and I pay more attention to it than I do my children, there's a whole form of life that's being excluded from the way in which this technology governs. So with regard to biotechnology, I want us to think about how the machinery of biotechnology not only locks in a certain view of the world, but then has the effect of excluding lots of other views of the world. And so the last point on the slide here is, if you can picture my circle on that diagram feeding back to the question of the strategies and tactics of power. The strategies and tactics of power in our society today, they work on particular kinds of objects. And I want to suggest that the objects that they work on are very, op very often the objects that are created by these machines, and so we get a kind of feedback loop. Okay, so finally, I'm to the story of biotechnology. Okay, with regard to biotechnology, I want to just say a few words about how I think about the machinery of biotech. Understanding biotech, again, not only as the kind of thing that's done in the lab, but also as a kind of um, organizational form that's trying to make its way in the world. I'm going to talk a little bit about three aspects of that, what I call digital biology. Then I would think about discrete states, that is to say the kinds of things that computers do. And then um, I want to give just an example of the things I'm talking about here by thinking about genome editing. Um, this proposition that you can use little bio-based technologies like CRISPR-Cas9, which I'm sure many of you have heard about, um, to re-edit our genomes. Okay, first, digital biology. I want to propose that the biotech industry today, particularly the kind of startup dimensions of the biotech industry, is at a moment and is well into a moment of what one could call digital biology. And digital biology, most simply, as it's experienced in the lab, what you might think of as a kind of soft digital biology, just names the simple material fact that since the 1990s, molecular biology and its daughter sciences has been done in the lab in a way that's totally mediated by computers, or almost totally mediated by computers. The way in which we think about the um, genetic makeup of an animal or a cell is based on the kind of information that we store in our computers. The machines we run to measure um, the cells that we're studying um, is done in machines that give us our data back on the computers. And so from the 1990s forward, you begin to see an increasing dependence in the everyday life of bio biological research on digital tools. There's a kind of everyday sense that biology, and then biotechnology in particular, that the, the um, drive to make new biological objects has been shaped by um, the use of computers at basically every step of the work. There is what also, though, what I would call kind of the hard digital biology, which is, um, as they say in Silicon Valley, the pitch side of all of this. And it's the idea that we don't just use computers to help us sort through our data. Um, but what use computers and the engineering of computers as the model for how we should think about the engineering of biology. And it's the second side of digital biology that in places like the Bay Area and I think in Boston, 
um, uh, has really become a major impact on biotechnology. Biotechnology has been thought of as a kind of species of computer programming in which you treat information in living systems the way you would treat information on digital platforms, and you begin to engineer it in that way. Okay, second uh, point with regard to biotechnology and this question of digital biology. Computers, and I'm gonna say some really general and unrefined things right now, that we have more time in the question and answer, we can think in a more sophisticated way about this, but computers are discrete state machines. Um, this is the idea that computers um, do operations that designate um, the difference between, say, a yes and a no. Um, the famous example is the one and the zero. The computers rely on a certain kind of mathematics, a computational mathematics, that sees the world in terms of its discrete states. The most celebrated version of this kind of computational logic is the algorithm. The algorithm is a style of mathematical reasoning in which a set of operations give you a determined outcome. Algorithms operate in a kind of lockstep way. And these machines operate in a kind of lockstep way in which you see discrete bits of things in the world, their patterns among and between them, and then you work on them through algorithms which operate in a kind of deterministic manner across these fields of variables. A number of philosophers of biology and biologists have thought about the way in which computers have become the main metaphor for the way in which we think about as information in biological systems, and have worried about all of those dimensions of biological systems which get called, and this is a term from the biologist Stuart Kaufman, non-pre-statable. That is to say, there are lots of things in biology where you can know the original conditions and not know what the next state is. That is to say, there are lots of things about biology that escape a kind of algorithmic logic. But when you're using discrete state machines as the basis of your mathematical relationship to biological systems, all of that non-pre-statable stuff becomes a kind of problem that in a certain way gets excluded from the logic of the very machines that you're using in the lab. And so these philosophers of biology have suggested that whatever mathematics we use for thinking about biology and therefore biotechnology, maybe we need a math that's beyond calculation and discrete states, and rather a kind of math that's capable of describing living systems and their fluid, fluidity and their dynamics. But in the meanwhile, we are now, as it were, in the grip of both excitement and concern around this technology called genome editing. It's a sort of, if you will, advanced mode of genetic engineering. Um, genome editing moves beyond what one could call the heuristic power of the computer, the idea that the computer is a kind of model for thinking about how information works in living systems and instead goes right after the idea that we can both use computers to edit our genomes, but that editing our genomes is a bit like editing software on a computer. And if you know anything about the history of engineering in software on computers, you'll know that in the very early days of this kind of engineering, there was a kind of hippie mysticism about software. And it was rooted in this idea that software as a kind of information technology knew no limits. It had a kind of logic to it, but it didn't have any kind of material constraints. And when this was connected to the personal computer industry, it quickly got bound up in the history of a kind of countercultural view of the world in which self-actualization, the idea that I can become my highest self and my truest self by connecting to a bigger world around me, could be achieved through software. And so there are lots of jokes about the so-called California ideology, which is the idea that the personal computer industry has been an outgrowth of countercultural um, sensibilities. Um, but the way in which this has taken form um, in the industry, the computer industry, is this idea that engineering of software knows no limits. It's a kind of hyperplasticity. And through the engineering of this hyperplasticity, we can achieve the highest ends of ourselves. This is what I would call a kind of algorithmic reenchantment of the world. It's the idea that we can use 
discrete state machines that are disembedded in the sense I talked about with regard to disenchantment as the basis for then connecting us all together again in a mode of re-enchantment. The twist here being it now all runs on an algorithmic logic, a logic of control. Of course, one outcome of all this with regard to genome editing is that it might turn out the biology doesn't work this way at all and the analogies from computers just fail. But one of the most powerful features of living things, the non-algorithmic features of living things, is that living systems are highly tolerant of constraints and can survive for a long time under these constraints. And so I think it's perfectly reasonable to assume the human genome editing will make its way down the road under the sign of the heuristic power of the computer and living things will go along for the ride, but now living things will be bound up in a kind of algorithmic logic. Okay, last step. I realize I'm probably running out of time here, um, so I'll move fairly quickly through this. And so big tech and this, as it were, algorithmic re-enchantment. I just want to say a word about how big tech makes its money. Um, what that has to do with the kind of algorithmic rendering of the world, rendering in the sense of the way in which artists render a picture. And then the kind of degradations that we have experienced in our lives in relationship to the spread of big technology through so-called ubiquitous computing. And then I'll just put a punchline on all of this. The first is, at least with regard to the so-called big five in technology the um, five biggest companies with regard to big tech, the way in which they make their money is they target certain features of human life that have been, as a group, referred to as the social suite. The social suite are all of those features of human life that allow us to live together in ways that we think are good. So these could be collective goods, like our ability to collaborate together, or these could be about good collectives, like the friendships that we have. So the way in which these technologies often work is they go after one of these um, collective goods. So the most notorious of these is Facebook now. Facebook goes after friendship. And what Facebook promises to do is intensify, it intensify friendship through a simplification of a technology platform that allows you in your, as it were, analog life to relate to friendship in a different way. But it does that through a kind of concentrated shift in our understanding of what counts as friendship. There's a kind of algorithmic rendering of friendship, to use the example of Facebook again, in which two things happen. The first is Facebook is interested in you living your life in a way that's dependent on this platform. So, interesting moment we're living in now. More people today in America say they're worried about Facebook than ever before, which basically means since 2002. Um, and yet, Facebook's profits in the U.S. keep going up on a quarterly basis. And the reason they keep going up is because even though people are very nervous about what these technologies are doing to our lives, we have a kind of dependence now on these platforms and the way in which we relate to each other. So first step is platform dependence. The second is surveillance. We all know this. There's a constant vacuuming up of data about all of our interactions. And through that surveillance and that vacuuming up of data, algorithms then can engage in micro manipulations that drive us in one direction or another. The notorious breaking of democracy through the way in which Facebook drives us into our political camps. But these algorithmic renderings of friendship, again in the case of Facebook, function on this logic of dependent surveillance and manipulation. So these technologies now are being built into everything. And what we now understand is that in targeting these collective goods, these technologies also degrade, techno degrade those goods. And so, to use another term from um, you know, Charles Taylor, we see through a connected world the return of a new porous self. Porous is the term that Charles Taylor uses 
to describe what life was like when we were embedded and interconnected. So we see a new core of self. We're interconnected again. Um, but this is a disembedded self that's been, commit, been interconnected. And now we're experiencing what the Greeks call stultification, the idea that we're being pulled in too many directions and our lives are being fragmented through the targeting of these individual features. And I just want to suggest that insofar as biotech operates on the logic of big tech because it's part of this industry, the interventions of things like genome technologies are likely to do these kinds of operations where there's a targeting of features, an intensification of features, and then a kind of stultification as biotechnologically we're pulled in multiple directions. So just a last slide here. I won't say very much about this. Um, but in this algorithmic re-enchantment, I'd like to propose that we think about the fundamental differences between the kind of porous self um, that we experience in an age of technology, not just biotechnology, and how that kind of interconnection looks fundamentally different from the kind of interconnection implied in this story that I told from Charles Taylor about holy matter, about a kind of deep interconnection among and between living things, the divine and the world, and the difference in the kind of power relations implied in the first versus the second, and therefore the question of the enrichment or the degradation of our lives individually and collectively relative to this provocation of algorithmic reenchantment versus a kind of sense of holy matter that is to say that the material world in our immediate interactions offer us something that these digital re-renderings can't offer us. Um, so I'll end there. Thank you. Can you see me? Hello. I can see you. Hi. Yeah. Thank you very much for a fascinating talk. I think in the interest of time, we're going to jump straight on to the next speaker and hold questions for the panel. Great. So um, while John November gets ready, I'll, I'll just say a few words about him. So uh, John is a good colleague from the Department of Human Genetics. The only important thing to know about him is that he is a certified genius. He was a recipient of the MacArthur Genius Award in 2015. Um, for his work on evolutionary history and genetic diversity of human populations. He's published his work in all those glossy one-name journals. And uh, I happen to know firsthand that not only is he a wonderful scientist, he's also a great teacher. So I'm looking forward to hearing from him as soon as he gets his microphone on. <laughs> John, you don't need any video, right? For no. Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> Thanks. It's a, a really a pleasure to be here and part of this um, discussion. I, um, by way of introduction, yeah, I'm a human geneticist, a computational uh, biologist. I analyze large sets of genetic data from mainly humans um, and develop methods for extracting information from that data. Um, what we're talking about today is the expanding scope for genetic discrimination. So this is an issue that uh, has become increasingly um, uh, salient for me in, in watching the development of the field and, and several of my colleagues. And uh, during my sabbatical last year, I had time to kind of dive deeper and think about it more deeply. So I wanted to share some of the things that I've learned and thought about and my perspectives here. Um, but it's certainly outside of my usual lane to be uh, talking in, in about some of the um, broader uh, interface of genetics and society. That said, it's an important, increasingly important role for biologists to play um, as uh, the biosciences have, um, advance so rapidly, they're, um, they're just increasingly contacting the world of society, which of course what brought us here. So um, to get us started, consider the following. This is a, a program uh, funded by DARPA called Measuring Biological Aptitude. Uh, there was a call for proposals this spring on um, how DNA and uh, other genomic biomarkers could be used to uh, en enhance the military workforce, helping uh, slot soldiers into their career paths based on their genetics. Um, I use it as a motivator for an example of a large-scale institution in our society that's thinking of using genetics um, for uh, deciding the, the fates of individuals within its 
uh, within its membership. Um, another example is this company, Genomic Prediction, which does um, in vitro fertilization and embryo screening. So this is a, a screenshot of one of their uh, outputs where uh, for a particular embryo it can report um, the, uh, the, whether the, the chromosomal um, karyotype is, is normal and also produce these uh, predictions about disease risk. And um, these predictions, I'll say more about how they work, but they're um, rapidly advancing. Our, 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 our ability to develop these predictors is rapidly advancing as a field. Um, and uh, they um, just announced as well that they're going to be including in these um, predictors predictions on uh, height and educational attainment which, for which genetic predictors exist, as discussed shortly and flag parents if one of the embryos they're about to pick is among the shortest 2% of the population in prediction or the lowest 2% in terms of intelligence. So um, there's, a, I think, a pressing need to think about uh, the prospects for genetic discrimination. And this is an important issue that uh, while CRISPR editing and, and, and uh, sort of germline edits are, are uh, you know, happening in extreme cases, uh, as we all know, um, some of these technologies may be uh, rolled out in a, a more widespread fashion more quickly. So I think it's important to discuss and consider. So um, what is the science behind these approaches? Uh, oh, sorry. I, okay, I made this in Keynote, switched to PowerPoint, did a quick flip through. I thought it looked okay, but I, I missed that some of the titles are kind of bungled, but that's okay. Uh, so I just want to review a few terms before I go on. Okay, so some basic terms in genetics. Remember, we have 22, uh, 23 chromosomes total, 22 autosomes, one pair of sex chromosomes. Each of those squiggly lines has a piece of DNA that uh, you inherit from one from your mother, one from your father. And um, if on those two pieces of DNA you inherit from your, one from your mother, one from your father, we can ask whether they're the same or different. If they're different, we call them different alleles. Um, and a genotype is the set of alleles that you have at any of those chromosomes. So an abstract notation that you might have seen in your high school classes, you would see like big A and little a, and so your genotype would be like big A, big A, or little a, little a, or A1, A1, or A2, A2. Today, we work with a molecular sense of what these genetic variations are. Um, we've moved beyond the world of Mendel, where it's sort of an algebraic notation for variation, where we actually understand the, the molecular basis and understand often one of the major forms of, of variation between DNA molecules can be what's called a single nucleotide polymorphism. So, um, let's see. So here we're lining up two DNA molecules. Imagine this is maybe the parent is the, the parent that you got from your mother, uh, this from your father, and there may be uh, many base pairs that are the same between the two, and then occasionally a difference. As it's called a base pair that differs. So it's a single nucleotide polymorphism. Poly for many, more for shapes. So. It's saying that there are multiple shapes here in the, in the DNA. Okay. Uh, besides these SNPs, as we refer to them, uh, there are other forms like insertions and deletions. Um, like uh, a famous one is the CCR5 delta 32 polymorphism. It's a 32 base pair deletion that if you're a, a homozygous carrier of it, meaning you got it from your mother and your father, then uh, you're resistant to HIV. Um, okay, so. Um, the big revolution that's been occurring in human genetics is in what's called a um, genome-wide association study or a, um, a, a genome-wide association mapping, uh, sometimes shorthand just called the GWAS. And the idea is that you gather a very large number of cases, a large number of controls, and then this image is to represent their technologies based on fluorescence that allow you to characterize what genotype an individual has at thousands of locations on their genome, with thousands of these SNPs. And then you can ask about how the frequencies of a particular, of carrying a particular allele differ between cases and controls, and scan the whole genome uh, to s for ones that differ remarkably between cases and controls. So here, what we're seeing is a, on chromosome 19, a very, uh, remarkable signature of a, um, a, a, a gene and a variant and it's and linked variants nearby that uh, differ between cases and controls for whatever these disease may be. Uh, here on chromosome 12, another one, eight, six, and so on. So we are 
especially as sample sizes are growing, and they're growing to the scale of hundreds of thousands of individuals. These studies being done even with a million individuals now. We're sort of lighting up across the genome places that nudge individuals towards higher or lower risk for a disease. Um, okay. Uh, and these nudges can be sort of summed up together to make what's called a polygenic score. So another way of representing what I was just describing was uh, here on the y-axis we have some phenotypic score and on the x-axis your genotype. And if your genotype predicts your phenotype, you get some kind of positive slope here. And that slope gets calculated and uh, encoded in a variable beta. And then your genotypes, so for the ith individual, the jth genotype, we can weight that genotype by the impact it has on the phenotype and sum that across all the SNPs to get a polygenic score. Let me put it another way. This is a matrix, and, and maybe this really gets to the point of digital biology. This is how human geneticists think of, of uh, genotype data for humans. Each row is an individual, each column is a SNP, and we just code zero, ones, and twos for whether you have uh, one of the three possible genotypes. Okay. And so an individual will be a sequence of like two, zero, one, one, zero, one, one, two, et cetera, marking what genotypes they have in each of these SNPs. And the slopes tell us how much to weight each of those SNPs in predicting uh, a, a, a polygenic score. A score that represents, um, in a sense, like the genetic baseline of an individual on top of which environmental perturbations will play out. Okay. Now, of course, we only have a partial observation of all the SNPs impacting the trait, so it's also all the other genes that we haven't detected yet. But. Okay. So, um, okay, so these polygenic scores, they're a form of predictor of a phenotype. Individuals with high polygenic scores might have elevated risk for a trait. Those with low polygenic scores are lower risk for a trait. They're the basis of a lot of the um, excitement and funding in uh, precision medicine. So uh, what I'm showing here is uh, a, a figure from an influential paper in the New England Journal of Medicine that shows um, the uh, event rate for having a coronary, um, uh, a coronary event, so a heart attack, as a function of years of follow-up from the first heart attack. And it's stratified by whether individuals have high, medium, or low polygenic scores. And what you can see is that the high group has uh, a higher event rate, um, and quite significantly higher. So here's about, say, about 18%. Here, maybe about 8%. So about a two-fold higher rate 20 years out. So the idea is that this could be important for medicine for helping monitor patients and, and, um, and uh, and recognizing which ones are at high risk and giving them perhaps uh, stronger prophylactic therapeutics, okay? Um, and using a, on the right is shown a lifestyle score uh, based on your know, rates of exercise, et cetera, and it has some predictive value, but the genetics is, is becoming sort of as predictive as the lifestyle metrics for some of these large studies. Okay, um, what is getting many of us sort of riled up within the human genetics community is that there's an expanding scope for these GWAS studies moving beyond the world of, of sort of traditional biomedicine. So this is a study that was uh, published in 2018 that is a GWAS of educational attainment in 1.1 million individuals. So this is now one of the largest GWASs done to date and it's on how many years of education have, uh, has an individual um, received. And uh, here's one of these types of plots that lights up in the genome, SNPs that impact educational attainment, and uh, a representation of how predictive these polygenic scores are. So in the lowest quintile, if you have a polygenic score that's in the bottom 20th percentile, on average, the completion rate for a college is uh, around um, uh, 10%. And then these are blue and yellow bars are from two different um, cohort studies in which they uh, did not know anything about the edu individual's educational attainment. They just had the genotypes and tried to predict, uh, or they really just observed the rate of completion based on the, what their polygenic score was. And, um, okay, and in the fifth highest quintile, uh, it's much higher, I think hitting 57% uh, yeah, for the ad health cohort. Okay. It's a relatively large difference. And, 
while this information is probabilistic, it cannot give a definitive prediction for any individual. There'll be quite a lot of error. One of the key things that's uh, important to appreciate is that for a large institution that gets to um, make decisions about large groups of individuals, it would still be beneficial. So you might make a mistake uh, placing a bet on any one individual uh, based on their polygenic scores to whether they'll succeed or not. But if you did it over hundreds, you would enrich the rate at which you would, you know, for instance, uh, be able to predict, say, you know, success or failure in some context. Okay. So, um, so this, this sort of expansion of GWAS into the social sciences world and uh, complex um, behavioral traits is, is something that uh, is, is pretty striking. Um, Dalton Conley and Jason Fletcher have written a book called The Genome Factor, where the social genomics revolution reveals about ourselves, our history, and the future. And they contemplate a lot of the um, issues that arise uh, when this is possible. So uh, they suggest that maybe there would be a shift from personalized medicine to personalized policy. So uh, speculating, if for genetic reasons, some people do not respond to health policies, such as taxes on sugary drinks or cigarettes, should we still make them pay this, the tax? Okay. So there's a, a kind of interesting arena that, that is developing and that I wanted to, to share. Now, one key piece of law uh, that's relevant here, which is GINA, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. So it's a bipartisan sponsored law that prevents employers and health insurance from accessing and acting on genetic information. It was passed in 2008. Um, it was described as the first major new civil rights bill of the new century. So. Um, in the, in the long history of uh, increasing protections and, and growth of civil rights and non-discrimination law in this country, a major landmark is, is GINA. Um, how does it define genetic information? It uh, defines it as an individual's genetic tests, the genetic tests of family members, and then interestingly, the manifestations of a disease or disorder in family members of such an individual. I think this is a pretty enlightened way of viewing it, that if your employer learns that breast cancer runs in your family and they discriminate upon you, that's a type of genetic discrimination, even though there were no molecular genetic tests involved because of the high hereditary nature of that condition. Okay, um, some of the values and conceptual framings that were used in arguing for GINA, um, and here I'm taking from a, a paper by Jessica Roberts from 2011, was uh, norms of protecting research participants. So those who are volunteering to participate in research are exposing themselves to discrimination and that would be um, uh, not ideal. And, and ideal, you know, and, um, by passing these protections, it would enable more people to participate in research with less fear. Um, uh, norms around human dignity that um, a sort of um, uh, inherent uh, uh, you know, value in every life uh, that should not be uh, conditioned on the genetics of that individual, uh, norms of equality of opportunity, um, that sort of regardless of what you're handed at birth, that you should have equal opportunity to pursue whatever path you might uh, choose. Uh, immutability, not uh, penalizing individuals for something that they did not have no ability to change themselves. And, and privacy, that um, our um, you know, values of privacy uh, protect an individual's sort of right to reveal as much as they would like to to the exterior world. And um, so an employer who might be demanding genetic information would be uh, violating that. Um, yet, Gina has major loopholes. So uh, it does not cover life insurance, long-term care insurance, disability insurance. So the image I show here is one of a, a genetic counselor talking to a uh, patient. And uh, I've spoken to genetic counselors who say, that they have situations where they might have a 25-year-old uh, male whose father passed away of a cancer that has a strong genetic component, highly predictive, and they want to test the child, the son, for whether they have these same uh, cancer risk markers. And before they can do the test, they have to say, uh, "Please get your long-term care insurance, your life insurance, in place because uh, you are potentially exposed to uh, much higher rates or being denied after this uh, test is done." And so there's a uh, you know, the threat that individuals are not fully uh, protecting themselves in terms of their health, pursuing their, their own medical care because of the fears that exist around um, uh, this, this issue. Um, more speculatively, as you have these predictors for um, 
uh, educational attainment, which of course is related to all sorts of economic outcomes, and uh, there are GWASs now on risk-taking behaviors. One might imagine that uh, there could be uh, uh, banks that in their mortgage calculators might take into account a polygenic score for um, some kind of economic behavior. Or um, as we've seen already, this predictiveness of educational attainment, uh, one has to wonder about you know, when will be the first um, private school or charter school or, or sort of educational innovator that's going to uh, ask for genetic information as part of like tailoring the classroom, but as also sort of sorting kids in, in um, or possibly um, you know, rejecting them in aims to, to improve the, somehow the, 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 the student body. The lights at the back as you walked in. Okay, so some, some, so there are these loopholes to Gina, and I think it's a major question upon um, this generation, this moment for us to ask what are some solutions. And um, uh, when you look more deeply at this, there's a lot of variation at the level of states in what is done. And California has what is called CalGINA, and Massachusetts has something similar where genetic information has been added in a broader sort of human rights, like civil rights context uh, as a protected area in which, um, such that it can't be used as a basis for discrimination. And those laws tend to cover housing, lending, education, um, all the categories that are covered by uh, the types of civil rights law that don't allow for discrimination on the basis of gender or age, for instance. Um, in terms of insurance, uh, multiple states have added additional uh, laws to prevent um, uh, discrimination using insurance. That, as I'll probably say in a minute here, um, is complicated, but uh, it is happening. Uh, and Illinois actually, uh, just this last year, um, passed a law that's relevant to um, life insurance and disability insurance for preventing genetic information being used in it. Uh, but at the federal level, it's not uh, full protection. The challenge with, inf with insurance is that um, a fear that asymmetric information will induce adverse selection. So this is the, the worry from insurers that if their customers know more than they do, and the customer knows that they have a high risk profile, they'll be more likely to buy a policy, and then the company will be more likely to have to pay out, and that will cause the price to rise, which then will actually create a stronger incentive for people to drop out if they're low risk, and this can create a death spiral of the insurance markets. Now, in practice, that may not actually occur um, if people do not react to the information very strongly. Um, and so, uh, for instance, in the UK, there's been a voluntary moratorium on using genetics for, by the insurance companies uh, for policies below a certain uh, 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 threshold. And this moratorium is being evaluated on a cyclical basis um, such that if a large number of customers do begin to use genetics and it's, this adverse selection problem arises, then they will try to somehow um, uh, come up with a, a, a solution. Um, the tension here is, is uh, what some call actuarial fairness of being like priced correctly for your risk versus fairness is embodied in GINA, the sense that you shouldn't be, um, uh, um, you should be protected from uh, having a different experience on the basis of your genetics. Um, risk um, and that privacy protection. Um, okay, so yeah, so there are questions about that I'd like to you know have us think about, and, and especially for I think many of you in the audience are, are much richer thinkers on an ethical and, and, and philosophical plane of you know how should we proceed? And there's a um, there there are sort of the pragmatics of um, of governance, of how do you actually like make something happen that will do a better job, and then also how do you make a case for it? Um, so, uh, you know, should we be trying to pass something like CalGINA at a federal level and then amend later as, as pro-social uses are rigorously identified? Um, is this just a special case of, of digital data and privacy? We're about big tech. Is this just a, like should like this data should be protected in the same way that your social media data should be protected from from being used in discriminatory ways. Um, I think one of the challenges is I've, I've read more about this that, that, that people are thinking deeply about it struggle with is uh, that in dis in working towards uh, um, uh, civil rights and equity in society, there's a tension between approaches that that uh, 
focus on equality. So you've probably seen this image of equality would be giving everyone the same box in this uh, situation of varying heights, trying to look over a fence. Equity is about giving people what they need to succeed. And a criticism of Gina is that it's a, a form of equality, not equity. In the, in the jargon, it's an anti-classificatory approach versus an anti-subordination approach. It says you can't be treated on the basis of your genetic information, right? That's saying you can't be, don't, don't allow anybody to classify you in that way. So it's saying let's treat everybody equal regardless of their genetics. And some uh, uh, scholars have said, well, that's actually a kind of old-fashioned way of dealing with um, uh, 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 trying to achieve a, a more equitable world. Um, relevant to this is, is philosophical discussions of, of whether we're striving for luck egalitarianism versus relational egalitarianism. Is the goal to compensate for the varying luck that we have each in, in being the hand that we're dealt at birth? Or is it um, that we actually are you know, okay with uh, the fact that some individuals have certain gifts and we want them to maximize those gifts and are willing to treat each other differently as long as we do it in a way that's relationally equal. We allow everyone to equally flourish. So those are, 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 are challenging, I think, and rich issues to think about. It. And, uh, and so I pose it like this, what does genetic equity really look like? Um, what, what should we be striving for? Um, just to conclude and give some conversation starters, I hope you get the, the main message that genetic prediction is becoming increasingly feasible for a wide range of traits and it has important social implications that I think um, should be taken more seriously. Um, there's this balance between the potentially damaging versus beneficial uses of these polygenic prediction methods and, um, and how to, to um, uh, be able to, to, to reap the benefits without the, the threats to inequity in society. And then um, at the moment, my kind of standing position is until we resolve clear goals for what genetic equity is, I think trying to expand cow genotype laws that are uh, in this anti-classificatory scheme is a feasible and important protective step forward. Um, you know, uh, legal approaches are always being amended and adjusted. And so the idea of uh, putting breaks in place that then can be amended as uh, useful uh, um, and uh, uh, perhaps more um, uh, anti-subordination type approaches to genetic equity are developed, uh, that can come with time uh, when those are identified. Um, so that's it. I just want to say thanks. Hopefully that's stimulating and look forward yeah. to the conversations. Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, so the first point, just to reiterate it, yeah, these are um, probabilistic predictors. They, they, most of them currently only explain a portion of the variation in the, in the trait. Um, and so um, there are yeah, many other factors adding on top. They're highly probabilistic. They're very error prone. And it's actually sort of an irony of this that at the individual level, they're, they're so error prone that it's not a lot of great good that you can do for an individual. But if for large groups, it can, like, on average, improve the fate of a group. And so it's, I, I think it actually favors action, the actionability in the context of a large institution facing many individuals. And um, so there's an asymmetry there that's interesting. Um, but the second part about the, the demographics of that educational team is so um, it, the, uh, most of the um, individuals using that study are from a European ancestral background. And uh, it's an important point that I s moved through. I was trying to help us catch up on time too. So the, um, these predictors don't work equally well outside of whatever group was used to train them. So the predictors do not work as well if you move toward into a, um, uh, an ancestry outside of Europe. Um, and, and even uh, another point is that they don't even work well. Uh, the performance suffers at least when you uh, have a different um, mismatch in terms of environmental contexts. So um, there are interactions between the genotypes and the environments in which they are um, uh, expressed. And 
Um, and so a study done in a particular uh, cohort with a particular SES profile is going to train on that, those um, uh, relationships and, and, and moving in by ancestry or by SES categories already been shown to have a huge impact on the predictability and that has interesting ethical implications about whether this might actually increase health disparities. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a challenging topic. Okay, so it's my pleasure to introduce our third and final speaker in this session, Professor Stephen Meredith from the Departments of Pathology, Neurology, and Biochemistry and Molecular Biology here at the University of Chicago. I would be shocked if anybody teaches more broadly on our campus than <laughs> Professor Meredith, who uh, in addition to science courses and helping me for many years with our ethics course for biological science first year students, teaches on topics as wide ranging as James Joyce's Ulysses, St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, Dostoevsky, and the problem of evil. Uh, Steve. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vicki. Thank you to our sponsors, and thank all of you for being here. Um, if when technology works, it's grand. Uh-oh, look what happened. I have to, uh-oh, here we go. Okay, there we go. Okay, so um, today I'm going to talk about two of the three books we are studying in my course a couple open-ended novels. Yes, there are three books in the couple. Um, mainly the first one, which is Brave New World by Aldous Huxley, and a little bit towards the end about Infinite Jest by David Foster Wallace. Brave New World was written in 1931 and published the, fo the following year uh, during what we in the US uh, now call the Great Depression in England Huxley was English. Um, it was called the slump or the great slump. And um, this fact helps to account um, for the cool reception it received um, uh, from readers who were not always sympathetic uh, to a satire targeting a world in which material wants have become more or less a thing of the past. Today, if you look up Brave New World on Google Images, you'll find a lot of images of armies of human clones. Um, this is still of concern uh, to us, this topic, um, in the popular imagination. Um, in, thank you, in, uh, for example, the movie Blade Runner, um, or the novel Never Let Me Go by Ishigura. Um, but when Brave New World was, uh, was published, it wasn't even known at that time that DNA and not protein uh, was the genetic material. That was still about 12 years away. Uh, so Huxley certainly knew nothing about genomes or cloning or gene manipulation. He nevertheless intuited something rather like cloning in his novel, the fictional Bokanovsky process, in which human ova could be made to bud like a yeast which would give rise to multiple copies of a human being. The more copies one obtained, the weaker was the product. Um, the world state in Brave New World was rigidly stratified into five classes, alphas, betas, gammas, deltas, and epsilons. The greater the number of identical copies of a child, the weaker was the biomaterial and the lower was the cast. The title, as you probably know, um, comes from a line in Shakespeare's The Tempest, and it is obviously used in a strongly ironical sense. <clears throat> now, um, in 1958, Huxley published a kind of follow-up essay entitled Brave New World Revisited, where he assessed what he got right and what he got wrong. I might add that I find him a little bit too generous in his self-assessment, uh, <laughs> but he did get quite a bit right. In Brave New World Revisited, Huxley compared his own dystopia um, to dystopian novel to Orwell's 1984. And he wrote that while or Orwell's book got the early inside track by portraying openly, openly repressive totalitarian regimes like the Soviet Union during the Cold War. war. 
his own dystopian vision of the future would be more on target in the long run. Let's move forward now <clears throat> from 1958 when Huxley wrote Brave New World Revisited to June of 2001. The Cold War is over and the Soviet Union has been dissolved. A new type of political threat will be on the horizon um, after 9-11 but arguably it will not be the kind of centralized type of totalitarian power that Orwell wrote about. Furthermore, in the interim, DNA has not only been identified as the genetic material, but we can play DNA sequences like a piano, shuttling DNA into and out of genomes almost at will. About those genomes, we have sequenced many, including the human one. And many animals have been cloned, starting with Dolly the sheep in 1996, and by 2001, many other animals. And it was obvious that there were no reasons in principle why the same could not be done uh, to humans. Now, and my editorial, um, in this setting, Leon Cass wrote an article in the New Republic Online entitled, Preventing a Brave New World. This was in 2001, June of 2001, why I chose that date, in which he praises Huxley's book um, while in passing, calling Orwell's book dated. Um, I don't know quite about that, but um, the following is a quote from Cass's article. The urgency of the great political struggles of the 20th century seemed to have blinded many people to a deeper and ultimately darker truth about the present age. All contemporary societies are moving briskly in the same utopian direction. All are wedded to the modern technological project. All sing loudly the Baconian anthem, conquer nature, relieve man's estate. Leading the triumphal procession is modern medicine, which is daily becoming ever more powerful in its battle against disease, decay, and death, thanks especially to astonishing achievements in biomedical science and technology, achievements for which we must surely be grateful, yet. Well, of course, the yet is the whole point of, of the article. Um, yet, <clears throat> contemplating present and projected advances in genetic and reproductive technologies, in neuroscience and psychopharmacology, and in the development of artificial organs and computer chip implants for human brains, we now clearly recognizes, recognize new uses for biotechnical power that soar beyond the traditional medical goals of healing disease and relieving suffering. Human nature itself lies on the operating table, ready for alteration, for a eugenic and psychic, quote, enhancement, I'll do the square quotes here, for wholesale redesign. For anyone who cares about preserving our humanity, the time has come to pay attention. This is a tricky thing here. Okay, so um, um, some of this, he worries, um, is already here. And um, now we're about two decades after the article that Cass wrote, and uh, the list in Cass's article might almost strike us as a little bit quaint. I mean, imagine how sweet it was of him to worry about mechanical spare parts. We don't worry about that anymore. Um, so, um, one thing that Cass said in the article um, was what he found scariest about Brave New World was not that the technological prodigies would fail, but that, but that they would work um, and um, do exactly what they said they would do. Um, the question then arises, um, or the questions then arise, uh, these questions, um, if human beings could be altered without limit, would such a thing as human nature still exist? And is the term human nature now um, an obsolete term? I must say that I worry, at least in part, that they won't work, Frankenstein-like, 
But I take his point. The danger of the brave new world stems precisely from the fact that its horror goes with, not against, our grain. As he put it, it is animated by, quote, our own most humane and progressive aspirations. In a way, Cass's article comes down partly to the old adage, be careful of what you wish for, because there is always a cost, always. But I think Cass was saying more than that. I would add um, that partly the problem is um, precisely this looking at the costs and the benefits and weighing the balance, looking at this alone as our sole moral compass. When you look at costs and, and benefits, are you in fact doing ethics or just economics? Well, um, for the two or three of you, if that, who have not read Brave New World, um, let me say a few words about it. Um, it occurs roughly sen seven centuries from now, and it is a world um, which in, uh, is indeed animated by our own most humane and progressive aspirations. Most of what we consider to be evil is now gone. Disease, aggression, war, anxiety, suffering, guilt, envy, and grief have been eliminated. I must say I would miss all those things. Um, after the horrific nine-year war, a war besides which even the Great War paled, um, humankind has finally learned to live in peace, a kind of peace anyway, without families as currently divide that viviparous anachronism um, we no longer have the Oedipal conflicts and the guilt and envy that come from families. There is no grief, no struggle, no pain. Death comes after high so-called quality of life and consists only of a painless Muzak filled falling off a clip, cliff before which there was none of the withering and dwindling of old age. These achievements, to the extent that they are achievements, have been rendered fully competent by genetic manipulation and sinister indoctrination techniques, one called hypnopedia, a psychoactive drug called soma, and high-tech amusements to keep people busy and unthinking. Sounds a little bit like reality TV. Um, but the thing is, you see, the world state is dystopia, not utopia. For all that it's done, the price for eliminating evils um, is this, homogenization, mediocrity, um, trivial pursuits, shallow attachments, debased tastes, spurious uh, contentment, and souls without loves or longings. The troubling part, again, is that the dehumanization can perhaps occur as a result of actions, not of a hostile, but of a uh, rather benevolent state, at least ostensibly so, one that gives us exactly what we want, health, safety, uh, comfort, plenty, pleasure, peace of mind, and length of days. As Cass says, if, um, in case you haven't noticed, the train has already um, left the station. Some of us are happy about it, others not quite so much. Let's talk about Henry Ford, shall we? Huxley read Henry Ford's autobiography while sailing around the world with his wife in the late 1920s. In Brave New World, the world state has come to deify Henry Ford, literally. While religion has been outlawed in the, in the world state, it has curiously retained many of the verbal expressions and practices of religions, but in a secularized, musacified uh, form. Strangely, Henry Ford has come to occupy a topos um, like that of Christ, though obviously without the sacrifices. Originally, the main satirical target of Huxley's satire was H.G. Wells's utopianism in, in the latter's novel, Men Like Gods. 
Huxley also satirized the collectivism of fascists and communists and psychologists, including Sigmund Freud and the American behaviorist psychologist John Broadest Watson. But Ford, that strange mix of good and ill, became the centerpiece of Huxley's satire. I will confine my comments to the assembly line, which became the model for reproduction and family-less rearing of children. To Huxley, and in fact, uh, and in fact, the assembly line managed to produce cheap goods, even at the price of sacrificing human individuality and diversity among workers. Ford did not invent the assembly line. He just redirected it in a particularly successful way. He pursued standardization as a means to get speed. But what I think, um, but what I and I think Huxley found most interesting is the fact that he got the idea from the meatpacking industry, though in reverse, putting together rather than pulling apart the carcasses so in Brave New World, the assembly line becomes the model for putting human babies, meat carcasses, if you will, together. In chapter one, we are introduced to the assembly line methods of producing humans. We also learn the motto of the world state, community, identity, stability. Just to be clear, identity doesn't, did not have its current meaning of individual identity. It meant that the individuals in the society should be identical to one another, like cogs in a wheel. The paramount virtue, however, was stability. Indeed, as Mustafa Mond, um, the European regional world controller, says that uh, crimes against stability are worse even than murder. After all, he says, murder kills only the individual. And after all, what is an individual? Um, I turn now to two pertinent comparisons. One is to Plato's Republic, and the other is to the Grand Inquisitor legend from Dostoevsky's novel, Brothers Karamazov. And in the interest of time, I'm only going to give uh, the reference for the first of these to Matthew Frank's um, excellent article in, um, in the New Atlantis, and um, then focus on the second one. And I also want to commend this second article by Nicole Catron, who was an undergraduate at the University of Chicago, and she took my Ulysses Clause course about um, some time before the Peloponnesian War. I shouldn't say that about her. She's not that old. Um, anyway, um, curiously, um, it was Rebecca West, the novelist, who first pointed out the similarity between the world controller, Mustafa Mond in Brave New World, and Dostoevsky's Grand Inquisitor. It's curious, partly because Rebecca West happened to be H.G. Wells's mistress for a time. Anyway, in the legend of the Grand Inquisitor, um, Christ returns to Earth during the Inquisition, and the Grand Inquisitor promptly arrests him and condemns him to death. The main issue for the Grand Inquisitor was that human beings are poor, weak creatures and unable to handle freedom. Rather, he says, they ought to sacrifice their personal freedom, their liberty, in order to end suffering. The Grand Inquisitor promises that if they will lay down their freedom to him, uh, in return, he can guarantee them material com comfort. Um, with us, everyone will be happy. They will no longer rebel or destroy each other, as in your freedom everywhere. Oh, we shall convince them that they will only become free when they resign their freedom to us and submit to us. We will be right. Will we be right, do you think, in lying? Now, um, in the um, final chapters of the book, um, <clears throat> Mustafa Mond con um, confronts three would-be rebels who, uh, and he lays out the philosophy of the world state. Um, the, um, 
the setting was that one of these would-be rebels had fomented a riot among the deltas, urging them to throw away their chains, in this case in the form of the narcotic-like uh, drug Soma, um, and live freely. And Mond notes that this would-be rebel, his name is John the Savage, called as such um, throughout the novel, does not like civilization very much. Moan starts by saying that John has a point. He concedes a relatively minor flaw, or what he considers a minor flaw, in the world state, which is its spiritual heredity. Now this is, of course, merely a rhetorical ploy, the name of which is synchoresis, to be exact, before the onslaught of his argument in defense of the world state. I would li now like to um, analyze Moan's defense of the world state um, in terms of the concept of the transcendentals. And so I need to say a few words about transcendentals. Transcendentals can be defined as universal properties of all being. Typically, among them are things like truth, goodness, and beauty. Thomas Aquinas in De Veritate um, posited five, um, and they are listed here, res meaning thing, unum meaning one, aliquid meaning something, bonum the good, and verum truth. Beauty is actually subsumed under a couple of the others. Now, <clears throat> um, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip this slide, which is to connect the transcendentals to human nature, and maybe we can come back to that during the Q&A. But I'm going to make the points now about how Mustafa Mohn's um, defense of the world state is basically an attack upon the transcendentals and therefore an attack upon human nature. So, oops, wrong way, went the wrong way. Okay, so first, Mond takes, uh, takes aim at beauty. And the reason he starts with that one is that John the Savage, um, this is a happenstance of the plot, but his education happened to consist only of the works of William Shakespeare. Um, and so John the Savage asks Mond, why is it that Shakespeare is now banned? Um, Beauty is the transcendental with which um, John the Savage is most concerned. Mond points out that, first of all, no one could understand Shakespeare any longer, and as there are no longer any loves or longings, no family intrigues any longer, that basically renders um, Shakespeare, and indeed all art, unneeded, obsolete, in fact, obscene. Moaned then takes aim at truth in two forms, religion and science. These are both gone in the brave new world. Now, although the brave new world was ostensibly founded on science, its real foundation was technology, making and doing, not science, which is about knowing. Science can be subversive and threaten stability. So, as Mond says, every discovery in pure science is potentially subversive. Even science must sometimes be treated as a possible enemy. Yes, even science. Now, the irony here is that Mond himself was once a scientist, a top physicist, but he had had to give this up in order to protect the well-being of the populace. And this, he says, was a terrible personal sacrifice um, for him. As he puts it, quote, happiness is a hard master, particularly other people's happiness, a much harder master if one isn't conditioned to accept it unquestioning, unquestioningly than truth. Well, this is very much like the Grand Inquisitor um, who, who um, admits that once upon a time he had been a seeker of truth and a seeker of God, but had given this up as a personal sacrifice only in order to maintain the happiness of the poor, weak masses. <clears throat> 
coming back to our, um, our transcendentals, morality in any sense that we would recognize it as is a thing of the past in the world state. There are no families and no relationships, just, just transient hedonistic couplings, so there's no relationality, the um, transcendental aliquid. Um, above all, there are no individuals in the world state, only functional exchangeable cogs in the wheel or the assembly line. And then Mond proceeds to the topic of religion. As he said, there used to be something called God. Well, it's not that God does or doesn't exist anymore. Mond admits, well, maybe God exists. In fact, he says probably God does exist, but it doesn't matter. Uh, for, for what need uh, do people of the brave new world have for religion anyway? Mond notes that God is something we turn to on our distress in the figurative foxhole, so to speak. But the modern world, says Mond, um, has no losses and therefore no need for God. I won't give a spoiler, but let's just say that John, with his limited education, is no match for Moan's eloquence. And one of the strengths of the novel is how well Moan presents the case for the world state. Now, even before um, Huxley revisited his earlier novel in 1958, he wrote a new foreword to the 1946 edition of Brave New World, and Huxley expressed regret that he had not given John an alternative. Um, um, insanity on the one hand, lunacy on the other. John just didn't have it, have the wherewithal to argue against Mond. So Huxley himself tried to come up with such an alternative, um, and he did so rather unconvincingly in a late novel, which was a positive techno-utopian novel called Island, and it's not really a very good book. I, have, um, I regret having to say this, but I think Huxley missed the point there. Um, why should the techno-utopia of Island be believable or a good thing? After all, I think Cass was right when he said that the scary thing about Brave New World was that the technology mostly worked and it was with our grain, not against it not against the grain of our humane aspirations. While we've always had despots who have acted out of naked self-interest and have tried to impose their personal will on others for personal enrichment and self-aggrandizement, the sad point made in Brave New World seems to be that even well-intentioned despots, or let's say initially well-intentioned despots anyway, also turn out badly perhaps as badly or worse than the bad intentioned ones. So what goes wrong? What is wrong? And here is where I'm gonna to turn to David Foster Wallace. Wallace, by the way, was a um, close and sensitive reader of Dostoevsky. The novel is about a lot of things. It's about tennis, it's about avant-garde movies, excuse me, film. Um, mathematics, it's about various forms of addiction, very important about that. And the center of it is an entertainment, sometimes called infinite jest, um, which is a kind of a video diskette that is so entertaining that whosoever watches it wants nothing else but to watch the same video over and over and over again, forsaking food sex, hygiene, and eventually life itself to continue watching. In other words, literally, not figuratively, entertaining ourselves to death. Um, this emphasis um, on addiction is, in my opinion, an Augustinian metaphor um, for the forsaking of one supreme and atemporal good for the worldly goods with which we try and fail to sate ourselves. Be that as it may. Throughout the novel, um, and its incredibly complicated plot, is interspersed a dialogue that runs through the entire novel. It's between two intelligence agents named Marat and Steepley, 
they, they are on opposing sides of a kind of battle over this entertainment, concerning this entertainment. It's between the Americans, or what America has become in the novel, which is a union of all the North American nations, and a group of Quebecois separatists. I can't explain more now, um, since the novel comes in at a svelte um, 1,089 pages. Um, but I urge you to read the novel um, if you have a year to spare. Um, anyway, um, Murat and Steepley's dialogue occurs on a mountain outcropping in Arizona overlooking the city of Tucson in the distance. They speak during a meteorological phenomenon called the broken Gespenst, picture of which is shown here. Goethe described that um, in Faust when Faust and company were en route to the witch's Sabbath on the Hartz Mountain. Well, as you can see here, it enormously magnifies shadows. So the dialogue, which um, is mostly abstract and philosophical, works like a kind of Greek chorus to the more specific and variously funny and gruesome actions of the novel. Because of the broken Kerspenst, Marat and Steeply literally tower over the brave new world of Tucson, Arizona. <clears throat> the debate between Steeply and Marat ultimately comes down to two alternative views or definitions of freedom. To Steeply, it's an ethos of choice, of products, of TV or TP uh, programs and so forth. To Marat and the AFR members, the Quebecois separatists, this is pointless. What Steeply calls choice is really another kind of slavery. Steeply's defense of economic freedom is simplistic at first. It gets better as it progresses. But at first, it's not as sophisticated defense of market individualism as one might get from Milton Friedman or the Austrian school. It's more like what you'd hear at, a, at an Elks or Rotary Club meeting. Um, it's made um, the US a superpower, but it's also give us, given us the year of the Whopper and other products. Um, time is in uh, this novel subsidized by companies. Um, but as the dialogue progresses, the argument deepens to steeply the freedom to choose products is only a small part of a much greater commitment, commitment to freedom itself. And this is what he says at one point. This is what lets us steer free of oppression and tyranny, even your Greekly democratic howling mob type tyranny. The United States, a community of sacred individuals, which reveres the sacredness of individual choice. The individual's right to pursue his own vision of the base, best ratio of pleasure to pain, utterly sacrosanct, defended with teeth and claw, bared claws all throughout our history, to which Marat sarcastically and dryly responds, bien sûr, you know, yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> Well, um, in response to this, Marat poses the choice of something to live for and die for. And so, quote from him, um, do we die to the Whataburger or the Purdue Wonder Chicken? As he says, choose with care. You are what you love. You are completely and only what you would die for without, as you say, the thinking twice. You, Monsieur Hugh Steeply, you would die without thinking for what? Well, this is, of course, a supremely Augustinian um, moment uh, because Augustine uh, said in many ways and many times that we are defined by what we love. So, for an, um, so to close, um, for an alternative to the um, techno nightmare of Brave New World and of Infinite Jest. Um, I don't want to look either towards nor away from science. Um, I would like instead um, to end by returning to Dostoevsky's novel um, in the Brothers Karamazov. The Grand Inquisitor is part of Ivan Karamazov's 
Ivan Karamazov's tirade against a God who would allow us to suffer, and in particular, would allow children to suffer. This tirade is never answered in kind in the novel with a counter tirade. It is answered, if it is answered at all, and this is a question, it is answered through the action of some of the characters, especially Alyosha Karamazov, the novice, and the practice of what Father Zosimir called active love. Um, on the other hand, the question for Ivan, as for the Grand Inquisitor, is whether or not they will hold to their former idea of enslaving weak humans, supposedly for their own good. The alternative would be to recognize the claims of love. This is also the question for us, as it was at one point for Mustafa Mond in Brave New World, and the answer to it is by no means certain. I will close with this well-known quote from Sigmund Freud's Civilization and Its Discontents, the last sentence of which was added in 1931, the same year of publication as Brave New World, when the menace of Hitler was already beginning to become apparent and was especially menacing to someone of, joy, of, of uh, Freud's, uh, someone like Freud of the Jewish faith. Um, the faithful question for the human species seems to me to be whether and to what extent their cultural development will succeed in mastering the disturbances, disturbance of their communal life by the human instinct of aggression and self-destruction. He didn't use the word thanatos, but that's the word that is sometimes applied. It may be that in this respect, precisely the present time deserves a special interest. Men have gained control over the forces of nature to such an extent that with their help, they would have no difficulty in exterminating one another to the last man. They know, to, know this, and hence comes a large part of their current unrest, their unhappiness, and their mood of anxiety. And now it is to be expected that the other of the two heavenly powers, eternal Eros, will make an effort to assert himself in the struggle with this equally immortal adversary, but who can foresee with what success and what result? Thank you. Okay, great. Um, I'll take the first part of it about uh, in vitro fertilization and the potential uses. So um, there, I think most of us feel like the science isn't ready to actually apply it in those contexts for any meaningful um, uh, change. Um, the, uh, and there's been some modeling done of uh, also like the efficacy given that the predictors are very noisy and that in the current state of the clinics you're selecting amongst a very small number of uh, embryos from you know, conditioned on the genotypes of the parents. So there's actually not in some sense very much to choose from, but there are sort of uh, imagined scenarios of, well, what if one could grow much larger numbers of embryos to choose from using stem cell technologies, and then there may be more efficacy of such approaches. So, uh, but at the current state, the science is not there, but the, the, that doesn't stop companies from, you know, a allowing customers to try to take chances with it. Um, so, um, that that's like sort of a you know a gut check of it uh, because of for the reasons that I mentioned that you know the predictors they uh, are only going to work they first they're very probabilistic on top of that there are the issues of them being trained on a particular cohort and if you know you're particular not from that same background it may not work as well so a lot of, a lot of open questions there okay um, and then, uh, oh gosh, let's see. The gene the editing. Gene editing. Okay, so yeah, so gene editing, yeah, yeah. So an interesting point here is if, if 
complex traits are the sum of many nudges and many biochemical pathways, you can't edit your way out of that. You know, you were, uh, unless the technologies evolve immensely, right now, you know, the idea of editing one place is, is edgy, uh, doing it safely. So to, to, to modify the thousand variants that are thought to affect um, educational attainment and, and based on that study would be you know, near impossible. But the idea of doing editing for um, single large effects mutations um, uh, that uh, there's, where there's a spectrum of gentle nudges to large ones, right? And the idea of using it for therapeutics um, is certainly on the table. Um, and then I think there was a question about the scientific response and, 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 uh, and there's a spectrum of responses from the, uh, that's outside my domain as a scientist to uh, those who are getting active and, and reaching out um, and trying to have a voice in these issues. Yeah, I don't think scientists can well regulate any better than anyone else can. That's one thing I would say. Yeah, I think it needs to be um, it's the responsibility of, of you know all of us, right? It's a it's an end. Um, scientists may be better poised to see some of the challenges on the horizon, but um, they're not necessarily trained or equipped for how to execute on uh, making those changes or coming up with policy suggestions, building the kinds of um, consensus and and. Uh, um, uh, action that is necessary to actually pass regulatory changes. So I think it needs to be collaborative involving a, a large number of specialties. I mean, I think one of the, uh, one of the issues, is the thing that Kamen was talking about, exactly what is power and who has it, and it's a lot more complicated than it seems. It's not, power is not just government. I don't know if you want to chime in here, Kamen. Yeah, I do. I would just say that I think it's an absolutely important question, a central question. And part of the answer is we don't have, we don't have any of the governance mechanisms needed to regulate any of this. The technologies are too distributed, and the people who are most in a position to drive them forward are people who are already benefiting from a world in which there's vast asymmetries. And those who will bear the burden of either the success of, or failure of these kinds of editing technologies um, are those who are already suffering the asymmetries of things like wealth inequality and the rest of it. So we're in a position in which these are technologies which if they work, as Stephen pointed out via CAS, if they work, we're in trouble. But part of the reason we're in trouble is because of the uh, potential to just intensify the range of problems that we're already suffering. So the question of how one can uh, mobilize humanity to deal with technologies that are going to evolve the future of humanity, good luck, but it's the right question.